Being Scared, The Sinful Savant, Unit 522, Slumlocker, and yours truly have come together to deliver over an hour and a half of true horror. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one. About three years ago, only a couple of months after my boyfriend and I got together, we were planning to move in together and rent a one bedroom flat. We'd had some crappy luck and had only managed to find one with potential. It was a converted house, not a block. The upstairs had been separated from the house with the hallway being made into a small porch and two doors. We accepted the flat before meeting the landlord, and it is something that I deeply regret. When we did meet him, as he was away when we were viewing the flat, I can only say that first impressions of a person matter. A lot. This whole gut feeling thing is real, and I should have followed it. He spoke very common English, in the typical, yeah mate, I like my pints in it. Do you know what I mean? That kind of British accent. And it irked me from the beginning. He looked strange, with horribly intense creepy blue eyes. I can't even remember vividly what he looked like. Because something about him made me not want to look him in the eye. Well, first meetings and impressions aside, he seemed kind of rough but was polite and explained the rules to living in the flat. Now before I go on, I want to say how shady this flat was. I had lived in other flats. The electric meter was run by pound coins and seemed to be considerably more expensive than the norm. The landlord told us that he would come in month by month to collect the money that we put in. Keep in mind that we were only paying for the electricity to run for an upstairs small house and it was costing us about £20 a week, which happened to be the same amount that my parents would pay for their entire house in the same area. I don't remember how much we paid for gas, but we didn't have a meter. The landlord also told us that we would be unable to have internet whilst we lived there, as it would involve making holes in the walls. The council tax would be included, meaning we gave our landlord our council tax with our rent. It also didn't help that the estate agent conveniently forgot to mention that his wife had died, and that was the only reason why he had converted the upstairs. The landlord told us this with no discomfort at all, and I couldn't stop thinking about whether or not I was sleeping in the same room in which she died, as in England. There's no law that says you have to tell someone when someone died in a house. The first time that the landlord confirmed my suspicions of being a bit strange was when we originally moved in. He told us that he had left a sofa in the living room and we could do with it as we pleased, throw it away, sell it or give it away. My parents, needing a temporary sofa, offered to take it off our hands when my dad and boyfriend were helping putting it in the back of his car, the landlord, who had been gardening, started freaking the hell out, saying that it was an anniversary present. And rather than telling my dad or boyfriend to just leave it in the garden for him to find somewhere to put it, he ordered them to carry it all the way to his garage. Horribly embarrassed, my father and boyfriend did exactly what he asked and let it be. I know you probably think it seems like a silly reason to start hating someone, but just the way he flipped, his behaviour, how rude he was about it, how he told us hours before that he didn't care what we did with it and then all of a sudden it was an anniversary present, as well as accusing us of not asking him first, it just really weirded me out. So a couple of weeks later, we start noticing that he smoked pot. Lots of pot. The porch constantly reeked of it, 
which was embarrassing for us when guests came over. I just want to say that I am completely not against pot. I really don't care if anyone uses it and I have actually used it myself. But what I'm saying is, when you invite people over, they don't usually want to be greeted by that smell. There's also another reason why he made me uncomfortable. I used to work at a bar for the first few months that we lived there. My dad would usually drop me off home at around 3am, which was when most of my shifts seemed to finish. He would always be looking out the living room window whenever I arrived. Seeing his shadowed silhouette just standing there really creeped me out no matter what time I came back. He also never approached me and always spoke to my fiancé instead. Early in the morning when my fiancé had come home from work, the landlord opened the door to tell him that I was being very noisy coming in at night and that he needed to tell me to be more quiet. This coming from a guy who was doing god knows what downstairs at ridiculous times in the morning. And I know it was a silly thing for the landlord to shout to my partner for, because I tried to be as quiet as possible to make sure that no one would have to wake up whilst I got in. Fast forward a couple of months, I realised that I'm pregnant. Me and my fiancé were super happy. We have some friends round one night, and the next day we go over to tell my parents about the pregnancy. Now before I go on, I should say that me and my fiancé smoked inside on occasion, when we couldn't be bothered to go outside. I used to smoke outside the bathroom window when my partner was on night shifts because I didn't really want to go outside, or risk encountering the creepy landlord. So one afternoon, me and my fiancé are cuddling, watching a film together. We hear a knock at the door. It's the landlord asking to empty the electric meter, which was very strange considering he'd only emptied it a week ago. But I didn't have a chance to tell my partner, since I hid whenever the landlord came in because of how uncomfortable he made me. I'm sitting in the living room with the door closed. It was a bit of a mess and I heard the landlord and my fiancé making small talk. But the landlord didn't put up his ladder to go check the electric meter. I hear him starting to walk around the flat. His voice irate and angry. And my fiancé tried to stay formal and polite. I get up to stand near the door and to be able to hear better. Apparently, my fiancé tells me later... The landlord had decided to do a sudden inspection of the flat. He'd walked directly into the bathroom and pointed at cigarette ash on the windowsill, not even hesitating or looking anywhere else. He walks directly into the kitchen and points to the washing up as well, saying that he's not judgmental about the way we live, but it had been there for days. I do admit that we were pretty unclean at that point, before he had the chance to get any further though, I opened the living room door with our contract in hand and shouted at him, reading the part that said he wasn't allowed to enter or inspect the flat without at least two weeks notice. He then said with the biggest shit-eating grin on his face that technically my boyfriend had let him in, so it didn't count. We argued for a bit until he blurted out, when were you going to tell me that you were pregnant? I'll always remember the deathly silence that followed after that, only broken by me. I asked him how he knew. He told me he'd always heard us talking about it. I told him that we hadn't talked about it anywhere near where he may have heard us because he could have evicted us, knowing that we'd eventually have to move out to a two-bedroom flat because of the eventuality. He then told us that he knew because of Facebook. Now you have to understand that my privacy settings on Facebook were set to the absolute max. My fiancés didn't even allow anyone who wasn't friends with him to see his statuses. Later, when we attempted to look him up, he didn't even have a Facebook account. I told this to the landlord, who then changed his story again and said that it was a friend that told him. 
this 40 year old man whom had never had visitors in the last six months we lived there had a friend to tell him right we got him to leave and both sat down freaked the hell out even more so after realizing that he never even bothered to empty the electrical meter before he left so that had never been the reason he'd knocked in the first place i didn't say anything even though i knew after all of that that the landlord must have been coming when we weren't there my partner admitted that a couple of minutes later the landlord must have been coming in when we were gone he knew exactly where the cigarette ash was on the windowsill straight away the bathroom window was never open much when i did smoke since it was only restricted by a child lock and besides it would have just looked like steam coming out the window if you'd have actually looked up i also never smoked out of it during the day only stupid times in the morning really and i barely smoked at all especially now that i was pregnant how had he known about the washing up being there for days and more importantly how the hell did he know that i was pregnant we figured out a way that he may have known at your first midwife appointment you're given a book of leaflets and you put those inside a big folder to bring to all of your appointments this sat in my desk in the living room a room he hadn't entered when he was doing his surprise inspection but when he'd gone in uninvitedly perhaps he'd gone through it we searched for cameras in the smoke alarm and other various places in the flat but the landlord had done the construction work himself so we had no way of knowing about any recording hardware without breaking the place apart we weren't able to move out until our contract allowed us i had to live there for a month in the early stages of pregnancy above a man who was either entering our flat whilst we weren't there or recording us we had enough evidence in our minds but nothing solid enough to go to the police i kept a key in the door every night just so that he wouldn't be able to use his just in case closer to the termination date of our contract we wrote an official letter to the estate agents explaining the circumstances we had reason to believe that he was entering without our knowledge and recording us and wrote one official letter to the landlord posting it through his letterbox the funny thing is he never confronted us about it didn't tell us that we were making up stories or lying and just ignored us whenever we saw him we managed to get out the flat and move to a different one which was just as shitty and had its own problems but you know what's the weirdest and most messed up part of it all we had all these meetings with the estate agent told them everything that had happened and talked about how dodgy the flat was especially with the electric meter and not being allowed internet and the estate agents even told us that they'd spoken to the landlord about it and that they'd sorted it whatever that means once we settled into the new flat out of curiosity we looked online the flat was listed under the same estate agents again knowing this guy could have potentially been filming or monitoring his tenants the estate agents still relisted the property and it scares me to this day knowing that innocent couples like us could be moving in there not knowing that the person could be going through their belongings as they please and has no problem doing so or could be filming them doing all sorts of things i know this doesn't seem as out there as other stories but it's real and so likely to happen to anyone the most horrifying thing to me though is to this day i never know what was really going on and if he hadn't have confronted us how long would we have lived there for not knowing that our home and privacy were being violated whilst we weren't in so creepy landlord who i'm still 90 percent sure about to this day was filming me and my partner during the early stages of our relationship when we were at it like rabbits i'm not sorry if you saw my voluptuous ass or watching me take a shit and let's never meet again number two 
When I was little, my family owned a cabin on a lake in rural Appalachia. It was pretty remote at the time, though it's been more heavily developed over the past 10 years. Anyway, when we would go to the cabin, we would often go for picnics in a huge field at the edge of a farmer's field. One day, we set up our picnic spot at the edge of a very steep hill. At the bottom of the hill, the field met the tree line of a very large forest. I was too young to remember everything that happened, but this is what I was told by my sister and my parents. We were sitting on the field eating when my dad heard really loud banging coming from the bottom of the hill where the tree line met the field. He walked to the crest of the hill and saw an enormous white creature standing on two feet and taking large logs and throwing them over its head to bang it off the tree trunks to make the loud noise. He showed my mom. She saw it, and we decided to pack up and leave. They were creeped out. Now my parents are very sane and rational people, so they never really talked about it out of fear of sounding insane. No one really wants to claim they saw a Bigfoot. Well, about four years ago we were having Christmas with my aunt and her family who would also frequent a cabin on the same lake. We ended up talking about the cabin, and we were sharing memories, when my aunt said she had an absolutely unbelievable story that she had never shared with anyone besides my uncle. She would always make blackberry jam in the fall, so she would often go picking for blackberries. One day, she said she thought she saw a bear in the distance eating blackberries, and that it scared the hell out of her, but she continued to pick and watch it in the distance for a while. Well. Eventually, the thing she thought was a bear stood up, revealed its white coat of hair, and walked away on two feet into the woods. Obviously, we immediately shared our story, and everyone was in awe that we had seen the same thing at approximately the same time, the late 1980s. I decided to do a little research, and it turns out there were a ton of sightings of this thing in the late 80s, and someone was actually so convinced that what he saw was Bigfoot that he dedicated the rest of his life to finding it again. You can look it up. There are numerous reports of people seeing this thing around the time my family saw it. I am not sure I really believe that this guy found the Bigfoot again, but he claims he found three of them together, two big and brown and one with thick white fur, an exact description of what my parents and aunt independently confirmed. I don't really know what to think. The rational part of me knows it probably wasn't Bigfoot, but I respect everyone in my family's sanity and intellect, and everyone was convinced that what they saw was not a bear and was covered in thick white fur and walked on two legs. I don't know how you can explain that away. Number three. This happened to a friend of mine last summer. About 20 students, including myself from my university, did a study abroad program in France last summer. We were spending a week in Paris before going to the towns where the university was located. Most of the group got a group flight deal to Paris through the university, and a few others flew separately. The only requirement was that we had to be in Paris by the day we had to leave to go to our university. Most of us had arrived by the third day into our Paris trip, with the exception of my friend Amanda. Naturally, we were all worried about her because her phone was not working properly. She had to update us through Facebook whenever she could get free Wi-Fi, which wasn't very often, and her flight had been delayed about six times already. Another day passed, and still, nothing from Amanda. We were all freaking out at this point, since her phone wasn't working. We had absolutely no way of contacting her. The fifth day rolls around, and still nothing. We all had a scheduled bike tour of the city that morning and a boat ride on the river that afternoon. So we didn't return to the hotel about seven o'clock that evening. 
Amanda was asleep in our room, as we were assigned roommates. Of course, I woke her up and asked her where the hell she'd been. She told me, when she finally got to the airport, she was exhausted and broke. She had multiple layovers and had basically spent all her cash on food. Plus, her bank card wasn't working abroad. For those of you unfamiliar with the Charles de Gaulle airport, it's absolutely massive. Unless you have a map or understand French completely, you will get lost. So, she gets there, lost, broke, tired and hungry, and carrying three big ass bags sitting inside the terminal. She said that this good looking guy then walked up to her and began talking to her in perfect English. You look tired. Do you need a taxi ride to your hotel? Red flag number one. What taxi driver gets out of his cab and walks into the airport to find a rider? Not thinking, Amanda says, Yeah, thank you so much. I'm exhausted. He smiles at her and grabs one of her heavier bags and tells her to follow him. She does, and he leads her to this elevator. Red flag number two. She was already on street level from where the taxis departed. She then gets inside, and he hits the button for the basement level. He gets on the phone before the elevator opens and starts speaking in French, which she could not really understand because it was slang. She starts freaking out as the doors open. It was a service deck meant for employees of the airport or something, not for passenger parking or taxi pickup. It was damp and dark, she said, something quite literally out of a horror movie. The guy gets out of the elevator first and turns to her, smiling. Allons-y, which means let's go. She takes a few steps and sees, in the far corner of the deck, the truck of this green, unmarked van with no apparent license plate, and a huge, ugly-ass Middle Eastern guy steps out of the driver's seat. It's at this point that she realises that she's in trouble, and she doesn't want to alert the smiling guy that she's about to get the hell out of there. There's no one in sight so screaming would be useless, but the lift door is still open. She quickly puts down one of her bags in the middle of the lift entrance to hold the lift and told the smiley guy that she needed her wallet and that it was in the bag he was carrying. He looks at her sternly for about a minute, but walks over to her and hands her the bag. She told me she pushed him down to the ground with the weight of the bag and got back in the elevator as fast as she could. He got up and was bounding after her. She said, Girl, I hit every goddamn button on that elevator panel. The doors closed and as soon as he reached her, she could hear him banging as she was going back up to street level. She got to the taxi pickup lane and began bawling. A police officer approached her and she told him what had happened. He was kind enough to drive her to the hotel. On the way to the hotel, he informed her that the men were likely linked to a sex trafficking ring that were approaching young women inside the airport who had tags on their luggage indicating that they had come from the USA, as they assumed that American women were more trusting. Number four. I once had a friend I knew for about five years. I met him when I was 11, and he was around 19 or 20. Despite the shady age difference, he never did anything that would make me think he was a creep. He was protective, yes, but in a fatherly type of way. My father was deployed to Iraq when I was 10, so he was like the substitute while my dad was miles away. We usually would talk over Skype and we would talk for hours at a time. I had a friend who also talked to him, but not as often as I did. 
Almost about a year ago, he died in a car accident with his cousin in Europe, and of course, I grieved. It wasn't often I would cry over anything, but this was something that hit me hard. This is only a little backstory. So I've always been someone who has trusted their gut, and strangely enough, even my dreams. It may sound crazy, but I've had small harmless dreams, which I experienced the same thing a couple of days after. Well, one night, I had one of these dreams. I didn't remember much. I was outside at someone's house. We were jumping around on a pile of junk, and we were just having a good time. There was a fallen tree against the pile. I don't recall much from the dream, mostly just the scene I was placed in. Of course, it didn't bother me. It wasn't scary in any way, so I didn't worry about it. A couple of weeks later, my mom suggests that I spend a week or two at my cousin's house, who lives out in the country. Of course, I accept this offer, since I wanted to get out of the house for a while anyways. That weekend, I headed down to where they live. They had a huge yard with a silo and a worn down hog barn. Right next to the hog barn was a large pile of metal, sticks, rugs, and basically a bunch of trash. Next to that was a tree. It was split in half, with one half leaning against the scrap pile. I didn't quite think of the dream, since my memory can be pretty bad at times, so I just saw it as normal. The first week goes by, and my cousin suggests that we go outside for a bit. I agree. Finding nothing else to do in their home, we head out. We walk around for a bit and talk, before making it to the scrap pile. I was the one who suggested that we climb around it. We both climbed up to the top and found cozy places to sit. I sat on one of the branches of the broken tree, and she sat further across the pile from me on an old rolled up rug. I can get pretty hyper at times, and it makes it hard for me to sit still sometimes. So I started bouncing on the branch some. Of course, a 160 pound girl bouncing constantly on a branch is going to make it snap, and that's what it did. I tried to grab onto whatever I could, which was a small twig on the tree, which snapped easily and sent me falling. I fell straight on my back on an old gutter that was facing down. The sudden events left me in shock and unable to move. I was slowly rolling off the gutter. Below was a thick piece of metal. A sharp jutted part of the metal was sticking up and was surely going to impale me if I continued to roll over. As I rolled though, I felt someone grab my arm. They pulled me back to balance on the gutter, and I was able to sit up and safely balance myself. My first assumption was that it was my cousin who had helped me. I was about to thank my cousin for practically saving my life, but I realized she wasn't even halfway across the pile. Her foot fell through a screen and she couldn't get to me in time. Apparently I had rolled myself back before I rolled off, but I swore I felt someone pull me back. Someone who saved me from being impaled and getting severely injured, or worse. I immediately told my aunt about this, and soon my mother. My mother agreed with me that it could have been anything, but I'm convinced that it was my father figure, that he was watching over me. I still contemplate about what happened that day. Number 5 It was 8 years ago. I had just rented a new house with my family in a very nice neighborhood, and we had just moved in about a month before I experienced this. I was in the habit of walking my dog every day at 6pm as soon as I got home from work. I would take her out. We always would take the same route. And one day, as we had just started walking, we passed a neighbor's house and witnessed something that we did not expect. We passed the driveway, and I glanced at the front door which was wide open. A man was talking to two women, but the man was crying uncontrollably. I felt very embarrassed as I walked by, and saw one of the women making eye contact with me. I looked away, but could easily hear the man sobbing and cursing. He was very upset about something but I could not hear what the two women were saying at all, or any sound from them whatsoever now come to think of it. I of course kept walking with the dog, 
and soon after, forgot all about it. So a few days later, I'd get home from work around 8pm. I was driving by and turning to my driveway. I saw that there were police cars, fire trucks and an ambulance parked outside of my house. I immediately thought of the other day and imagined that it was connected to what was going on in some way. I pulled into my driveway and entered my home. My wife was cooking dinner and my kid was playing. I wanted to walk by and get a better look at what was happening. My wife said that she had no idea that something was going on and I quickly got my dog ready. We went out for the walk and as we were walking by the house, I saw several people rushing around. It looked like a scene from a movie or a TV show. I stopped for a moment and just watched. A man that was walking back to his police cruiser saw me and then approached me. He questioned me a little bit and I told him that I lived a few houses down and that I was concerned. I asked what happened and he told me something I'll never forget. He said that one of the women that lived there was brutally assaulted and murdered, whilst the other was in critical condition in hospital. He saw that I was in shock after hearing this and asked me to go on my way. I first told him what I saw two days earlier and he said not to worry that they had the man who did it. He had confessed. I resumed the walk in total disbelief and my wife was equally in shock about it when I returned home. I later saw on television a picture of the woman who was killed. It was one of the women I saw that day talking to the man. The news said that she was killed by her ex-boyfriend and then went on a rampage beating her best friend who fortunately survived. They eventually showed his picture as well. I felt a bit sick when I clearly saw that it was the same man crying that day. Number 6 When I was around 10 years old, my family took a trip to Egypt. It was a sort of half cruise down the Nile. We would stay often in various spots to check out things, and I don't think we honestly actually traveled on the boat very far. It's where our rooms were though. My memory is a bit shaky on the finer points, as it was almost 20 years ago. But I do remember lots of the cool things we went to see and do. The Great Pyramids, riding a camel, museums, mummies, etc. But I also remember a lot of not so fun things. Like the tour guide telling my family that my mother and I could never be by ourselves without either our male family members or others from the tour group. They told us that the men in the country would see a single woman as someone seeking sex, as they wouldn't travel alone otherwise. Or the man offering my father a herd of camels for me, and a bit less for my mother, as she was older. On the top of the ship we were staying at, there was a swimming pool. One morning as I was using it, sporting a one-piece bathing suit, there was a boat driving past where we were moored full of men. They were hooting and hollering, applauding, and making a general ruckus as they could see me. And I put on theatrics because of it, diving into the pool, strutting around, loving the attention. I cringe at this now. Years later, my mother told me how in a store selling souvenirs on shore, she was groped by the seller. He was placing a necklace on her and gave one of her breasts a really invasive feel. She told my father and he shrugged it off at the time, and she was still mad at him over it. I understand. I would too. Good job, Dad. Not. And to this day, I remember the one morning my parents went to go watch the sunrise over the desert. It required a very early wake up, and my brother and I declined to go. So while my parents were out in the desert looking at the sun, my brother still sleeping, I decided to go to the pool. This may have been the same day that I was catcalled since I was at the pool area by myself, but I'm not 100% sure. I do remember that on the top of the ship there was a hatch going down one level near the pool, 
That day I eyed it and decided I had to know where it went. It was easy to open, and I climbed down a short ladder to the deck below. This deck was still open to the outside, with doors leading to compartments and such. The way the boat was moored, we were a couple of ships out from the port. To get off the boat, you'd have to traverse the other ships in between, but I think this was a normal thing. They were all lined up together, and the travelers would simply disembark by going through the various ships until reaching shore. I went right when I reached the ladder bottom. Noticing the major differences from the other areas of the boat I had been on, this area was dirtier and there were ropes and other junk lying around. I found where the kitchens were and I stood a while looking through the window. I remember it seemingly rather gross looking in there, which redoubled my desire to never eat there. My family had already decided to not eat on the boat when a waiter visibly sweated into the soups he served us. I went back towards where the ladder was, then continued a bit to the left. From this vantage, I could see all the ships between ours and shore. I think there were around three to four in total. I noticed on the far ship that a man was hopping over the railings and coming towards me, one boat at a time. This is verse coming through the main area which had been set up for the tourists to easily get through all the ships to get to shore. I backed up a bit, back towards the ladder as I realized he was making a beeline toward me. He came over the railing and I don't remember what exactly he said to me, but it was an introduction in heavily accented English. He asked me if I wanted to party. I was a little confused. In my head, party is when my parents had friends over and lots of music and dancing. I liked parties. Sometimes I got to stay up late and dance too. I don't remember exactly how he convinced me, but I remember standing in the open doorway to the cabin where he was inviting me in. It smelled like smoke and there was a haze all throughout the room. Three men in the traditional garb. I don't know what it's called, the long flowing dress like shirts that they wear, with the headgear as well, were sitting and smiling at me, waving their hands at me, a hookah nearby them, bottles everywhere. Outside the room the sun was shining and everything was bright and lit up, and there was an underlying smell I couldn't place, smoke drifting, and the blinds were all shut, giving the room a reddish tinge. Out of everything, that memory is the most vivid. I remember looking up at the smiling mustached man standing in the doorway. He wasn't intimidating, a bit scrawny. He had a good smile that didn't seem off. My little prepubescent brain didn't light up though. It went, I'm pretty sure this is one of those situations that I'm not supposed to be in and I really need to go right the heck now. So I booked it. I turned tail, skedaddled to the ladder. It wasn't that far. I didn't look back a single time, just got up the ladder as fast as I could and ran back to our room. My brother was in, where he was still sleeping. I told my parents after they returned. They made a complaint, but nothing ever came of it. The room in question was just a crew member's lounge or something. I never saw any of those guys again. My parents left Egypt disgruntled. I never really thought about it again until a few years later when I was older. Would I be dead by now? Sold into a sex ring? Married to some Egyptian guy with a bunch of kids by now? It makes me shudder to even think about it. And very grateful that my school did cover a little, not enough, about stranger danger. It was enough to make me reject the very friendly guy and realize this was a bad situation for me to be in. With all the weird situations that happened on that trip, and the fascination I apparently held for being so young, I can't help but think that something terrible would have happened if I had gone into that room. Skeeves me out to this day. Number 7 This story was back when I was a child. It was around 1996 and we had almost nothing to do in the little town we lived in. My mother had been working on me using a Ouija board and the do's and don'ts with it. I was happy, seeing as I was only 9 or 10 years old at the time. It was about this time that the school we went to hurled an overnight movie camp out. 
it was a 24-hour lockdown in the school, and it was the first time I got to go. My older sister was there as well, but did not stay close to me most of the time. Around 8 or 9pm, one of my friends pulls me out to the main hall, and we ran to the 5th grade stairway. There was a little place to sit under the stairs. As we got there, two other girls were smiling, and I saw a bunch of candles lit. They had a Ouija board there, and they wanted to see if the school was haunted or not. The first thing I could think of was to talk them out of it. They told me not to be a baby, and I eventually stopped talking and did what I needed to do. I walked away, and went to get my older sister. It was the better call to make, and as my sister got there, the planchette started moving on its own. She just slammed her hand down and pulled it to goodbye. It didn't move after that, and she yelled at them and told them to go back to the gym. The very next day, my mother, my sister, and myself put the board in a black bag and threw it in a ten foot hole. The girls had opened a gate and let something in. That school now stands unused. It was out of code in 2003 and my auntie told me that things have been seen in it and it will never be the same again. Number 8 My grandfather's company, which involves timber and mining, was setting up an office in a relatively remote part of a third world country and found a house that was dirt cheap, even for third world country standards. Obviously there was a catch. The villagers in that area told him not to purchase it since the house was haunted and everyone who had ever lived there died violently. He decided it was just some superstitious BS and got it anyway. So the guy setting up the house will live on the top floor of the house with his family and the lower floors for the office. He moved in with his family and three kids. Anyways, my grandfather suddenly got no news from him for the longest time. Since this was a remote part of a third world country, he wasn't too worried since he just assumed that they lost power or something. He finally contacted the local police to go check on the guy since he was completely unreachable. They found everyone dead. Apparently the guy killed his wife, kids, and then himself with a machete. Yes, not a gun, a fucking machete. He actually hacked himself to death. It wasn't one of those cuts on the wrist to let you everyone slowly bleed to death. Everyone was hacked down, including the guy himself. The description of the scene had to be an exaggeration, since I'm assuming the sight of five decapitated bodies, including three kids, were scary enough to make people see things. So I won't bother putting it in here, since I'm not sure what's true, and there were details that people could not have possibly witnessed. Let's just say I stopped paying attention after I heard the phrase, magic machete. I was told the entire room was covered in blood, including the ceiling. Some people were saying the blood on the ceiling had to have gotten there because the spirits threw the bodies around. I had to explain about blood pressure, and got tons of weird looks. Now, the weird part. If this isn't weird enough, was that he managed to barricade the door with the bed, with his wife and kids on it. And it's one of those gigantic old beds that it's extremely hard to move. The locals say this is evidence he was possessed by spirits. I say moving to the middle of nowhere in some third world country drove the guy nuts and crazy people can do all sorts of crazy shit and even perform crazy feats of strength. Anyway, my grandfather had to pay a few bribes to make sure nothing got to the press. Not hard in the middle of nowhere. I built the entire thing and get the police to classify the deaths as natural. No idea how they'll explain that. Third world countries are awesome. He tried getting other volunteers to set up the office. Even if they haven't heard all the gory details because of my grandfather's gag order, everyone knew that the previous guy died. No one volunteered. He promoted one guy, gave him a fancy title, and told him he's in charge of setting up that office. The guy quit. Number 9 I'm a flight attendant, and have been so for the past few years. I would like to share a story 
that happened to me personally. I work for a national airline that mostly operates regional destinations. Mostly, we use single aisle planes. There is only two galleys, the front galley and the back galley. The front galley is close to the cockpit. Thus, it has installed CCTV there for the pilots to monitor activities in and around the cockpit door. During a flight at cruising altitude, the captain called the leading flight attendant to ask her why they let two little kids play in front of the cockpit door. The B737 is a small plane with the cockpit door very close to the crew's seats. The lead flight attendant with another crew member was sitting at the crew's seats and denied that any kids were playing near the area as the seats were situated right next to the cockpit door. But the captain insisted that he could actually see these two children, a boy and a girl, playing in front of the door through the CCTV. At this point, the leading flight attendant was not very happy thinking that the pilots were just trying to pull a prank on them. After some time, the captain let it go and told them to never mind. When they touched down and got to the hotel, the captain pulled the leading flight attendant along with his first officer aside. He insisted to know if the leading flight attendant and her crew really did not see these two kids playing in the front of the cockpit door. She maintained that they did not. And since the galley is so small, like seriously about less than 10 meters long only from port side door to starboard door, and that consisted of crew seats, entrance to the cockpit and the galley, there's no way she could have missed those two kids playing. Both pilots went white. And then they said that they saw the children playing right beside the flight attendants and wondered why they would just let them do that. The first officer confirmed what his captain had just said. But because it was so late anyways, the leading flight attendant wouldn't want to scare her crew and decided to keep it to herself. She only asked the crew that was with her during the incident if she didn't also notice the two kids. Both maintained they didn't see any kids. And up to this day, nobody knows who the two children were that the pilot saw on the CCTV. It's some seriously creepy stuff. Number 10. My grandparents decided to take the whole family on a cruise at Christmas time around the Caribbean. There were 14 of us, so we were all located in different cabins spread over different floors. I'm a female, so my sister and myself shared a room. I was 16 and my sister was 14. On our first night, we could hardly sleep as the couple in the adjoining cabin were having a very loud argument. The man kept calling the girl a whore and shouted that she was only there because of his money. It went on until the early hours of the morning. After that night, all was quiet and I assumed that the girl had moved to another cabin as I never seen or heard her again. The next day we were up early for breakfast. I was keen to explore the ship and my sister was taking a while to get ready. I thought if I waited in the corridor that I would encourage her to hurry up. While I was waiting in the corridor, I heard the next door opening and I couldn't help but look to see who the man was that had been doing all of the shouting. He looked at me and his eyes lit up straight away. This horrible feeling came over me. The feeling I now know is gut instinct. I just knew from the way that he looked at me that he was bad news. He looked to be in his 40s and looked normal, but I couldn't stop the shivers traveling up my spine. He said hello, but all I could manage was a faint smile. I decided I'd head back into the room as I was chapping on the door. The man was walking down the corridor to the elevators, but repeatedly looked back to look at me. From that point on he seemed to be everywhere. In the dining room at lunch, he would sit close by. At the pool, he would only be a few loungers along. A couple of times I got in elevators only to have him run in behind me, even though I hadn't seen him around before I entered the lift. 
Luckily, even though I wasn't with my family, there had always been other people in the lift when he ran in. All he did was stand and stare at me and I would get shivers down my back. The first couple of days I tried to ignore it. I had always gotten attention from boys. I tried to just brush it off as a bit of attention but something didn't seem right. Especially since the ship we were on was massive and there was so many people on board. I started to find it hard to believe that he would just randomly bump into me. We had told my mom and dad and the others about the argument in the other room from the first night but I couldn't bring myself to say anything about the man following me. I felt embarrassed. Silly, I know. Near the end of the week, I wanted to leave the pool and get changed to go watch a movie with my cousins. My sister wanted to stay at the pool so I headed to the room by myself. When I got in the elevator with another few people, I noticed the man sneak in at the end and all I could feel was dread as he stared at me. The other people on the lift got off at our stop but went in another direction. As I walked down the corridor to my room, I could feel the man's eyes on the back of my neck. I quickly sped up and hurried into my room. A minute passed, and there was a knock at my door. Immediately, I knew it was him. There had been no one else in the corridor. The knocks continued as I panicked on what I should do. I thought I would have to answer the door because he had watched me enter and knew I was there. I answered the door and the man had the creepiest smile on his face. Hey, sweet thing, I'm locked out of my room. Can I come in to use your phone? I knew he was lying. So quickly I thought of something to get out of the situation. Sorry, our phone isn't working, I said as I tried to shut the door. Oh, fuck, you're Scottish, he asked in a surprised voice. I mumbled something in agreement, shutting the door, but he stuck his foot in. I decided to use all my strength and batter the door against his foot. He cried out in pain, but put his other foot in place. Hey, I just need to come in for a minute. He kept shouting at me. I told him he should just go to reception and continued to try to shut the door. The panic was flooding through me. The next minute I heard someone say, Jess, what's going on? With relief I realized it was my older male cousin Jonathan coming by so we could go watch the film. Who are you? Jonathan shouted at the man. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you were Scottish. I thought I knew your friend from back in the US. The guy mumbled. It's just a misunderstanding. He hopped away and proceeded to enter his room. We left the next morning and I didn't see him again. I will never forget that creepy expression he had on his face every time he looked at me. It makes me sick to my stomach. Number 11 In 2010, I was newly single and tried for the first time using online dating. I had a long string of unsuccessful candidates and everyone I seemed to find just didn't match me after the first date. But I got talking to this girl Jennifer. Me and her hit it off straight away. She really seemed like someone who I could get along with. After a few weeks of chatting, we exchanged phone numbers. She really digged that I was a cop. And we arranged a time and a place to meet and discuss what we would do on our first date. She said, I'll rent a movie and order some pizza. We can just hang out at my house. She lived out in the country. Her house would be a little difficult to find so we met up at a gas station so that I could follow her to her place. When we arrived at her place, I noticed she lived alone in a house. I asked her if she had any roommates, and she told me that she was a teacher and recently bought the property. I didn't think much of it. That sounded pretty legit to me. Once inside, we sat down, started the movie and chowed down on some pizza. Later on, we decided to cuddle on the couch, and then we started making out, and it went from the couch to her bed. As we were laying on her bed facing each other, looking into each other's eyes, I saw something standing in the doorway of her bedroom out of the corner of my eye. I turned my head to look, when I see 
this thing standing there. I was paralysed with fear. It was the blackest, darkest shadow that I had ever seen. It looked like someone was wearing a cloak with a hood up, over its head like the Grim Reaper. It took two slow steps, walking across the doorway until it disappeared behind the wall. I jumped up, and she did the same when she saw me jump. I whispered in a panicked voice, There's someone in the house. At this point in my life, I was in police officer mode. I knew what I had seen, but my logic told me that it was an intruder. Like a dumbass, I left my firearm in my car. I guess I didn't want to make her feel uneasy having a gun on my hip. So I looked around the bedroom for anything that I could use as a weapon. She had a huge candle in a glass jar on her nightstand. I picked it up and thought, I'll smash this over their head. Together, she and I searched her house from top to bottom and we didn't find anyone. Once we finished searching the house, a feeling of dread and terror hit me like a ton of bricks, because at that moment I realised what I'd seen. I described it to her, then she started crying and accusing me of not liking her and just making up shit so that I could leave after we'd slept together. I said, are you kidding me? Then it was like that little voice in my head was telling me to get out and get out now. I told her to pack her bag and stay with a friend or come with me. But I wasn't going to stay in that house for a second longer. I don't think I've ever pulled out of a driveway so fast in my life. I was speeding and didn't slow down until I was three blocks away from my house. About a month later, I received a message from Jennifer on Facebook. She told me that she believed my story now, and said that since that night, weird things had been happening in her house. I asked her what happened. She told me that at night, she would hear pots and pans rattling in her kitchen. Doors would open on their own, and the television would turn on and off by itself. I think Jennifer moved out of that house shortly after. Number 12 This teacher joked around and wasn't really ever serious, but was funny as hell and an overall good teacher. But when Ouija boards came up, she got extremely serious and told us her bone-chilling story. She had some friends over one weekend, and they got bored, and they decided to break out the good old household Ouija board. They had asked questions, and got weird vibes from some of the answers. They received these answers, but pushed on forward. Finally, someone asked when they would die, and it went around the circle, and everyone got a decent number in the 80s or 70s, but one girl got the age 19. Granted, they were juniors, seniors in high school, so that was only a few years away. A few years go by and the girl who got 19, as the age of death, was killed by a car while walking on a beach while on spring break. Her friend she was with broke her leg or something. Anyways, she was just 19, one week away from turning 20. The nature of the death and the fact that she was close to her 20th birthday make it so scary because she was so close to defying the Ouija board. Never, ever doing it needless to say. Too terrified to get an answer like that. I have a story on a Ouija board as well. And since this day, 15 years ago, I have never used one since. Before going any further, I don't believe in an afterlife. I'm an atheist, but something that happened years ago when using a Ouija board, freaked me out, and I will never forget it. It was me, a good friend of mine, John, and a few girls. We were in my house, and one of the girls brought a Ouija board. I thought nothing of it. So fast forward into the night. The girls were using it, but myself and John were just hanging out talking and having a beer. 
At one point in the night, we decided we want to get pizza. So John and I go pick up pizza to bring home. When we got back, the girls were a bit flipped out, saying they were getting creepy statements from the Ouija board, stating that spirits were watching us and keeping a close eye on what we were doing. One of the girls said, the spirit said they really watch John close, but the name was misspelled. So she was starting to doubt that the spirit even existed. It was then that John said he spelled his name J-O-N. We never knew this. He took out his wallet and showed us his driver's license. His face was white with fear. From that day on, I never wanted a Ouija board in my home. I can't explain how that happened that day, but it was enough to really make me think. Number 13. This happened to my sister when she was 13 years old. She said that it was alright if I share her story. It happened on Christmas Eve. Ever since this incident, my sister has not enjoyed the Christmas holidays like everyone else. I should also mention that my parents are divorced, and during this experience, my sister and I were at my mum's house, and at the time she was single so it was just us three in the house. Christmas Eve was going normally. We were listening to Christmas songs, making cookies for Santa, and my sister and I were attempting to wrap our presents to our cousins. It got quite late, and we were all excited to go to bed. So we set our cookies out for Santa, and my sister and I went into our rooms to go to sleep. Not too long after we went to our beds, We heard a man come into the house. He was talking to our mum, and it sounded normal, like a non-threatening conversation as far as we could hear, and our mum definitely invited him inside. After we heard them talking, they eventually became quiet, and I heard nothing else until the following morning. My sister's night went differently though. She says that later in the middle of the night, she awoke and saw the man standing in her room, going through her dresser drawers. She was terrified and didn't say a word. She said that she assumed the man was looking for her underwear, but wasn't positive. After watching him for a few minutes, she says he turned around and walked towards her. At this time she closed her eyes and pretended to be asleep out of fear. My sister says that she just lay there. She could hear the man stop next to her bed, and for the longest time she could hear him breathing, and that she could just feel him looking down at her, thinking that at any second he might touch her. Thankfully, he never did. She says that he must have stood above her for at least ten minutes minutes before he finally left the room. The next morning I heard her crying and my mum comforting her. We found out that he was a man my mum was seeing and he must have left her bedroom in the middle of the night when she fell asleep. Needless to say, my mum called the police but nothing ever happened to him. It still scared my sister to death. And on every Christmas Eve now, she sleeps in my mum's room. Number 14 One night, I was hanging out with my aunt and uncle when they randomly asked me if I'd believe in Bigfoot. I said, I do not, but I had an experience I certainly can't explain away. My buddy and I were passing through rural McKean County, Pennsylvania, in the Appalachian foothills after spending time in my family's hunting cabin in neighboring Potter County. I was telling my buddy about McKean County's main tourist draw, the Kinzua Bridge, once the world's tallest railroad bridge. Sadly, a few years ago the bridge was felled in the middle of the night by a tornado, ripping apart its midsection and leaving only the portions of the bridge anchored into the hillside standing. 
On the valley floor are rusted, contorted steel beams, some reaching dozens of feet into the air. Even though it was fast approaching midnight, my friend wanted to do some good old-fashioned trespassing to check it out. So did I. It being late at night and in the middle of nowhere, there wasn't a soul around. We hopped over their laughable security apparatus, a rented chain-link fence that wouldn't deter an eight-year-old. It's close to a full moon, and we're now a hundred feet or so above the valley floor on what's left of the former monolith. We're doing the stupid, teenage, young, twenties bullshit us guys do. Leaning over the edge where there used to be hundreds more feet of tracks, spitting off the edge, pissing off the edge, you know, all the prerequisites. After we grew bored of that, we began to rip off chunks of railroad ties. It was scary how easy it was to do this to something that had very recently had trains running on it. Naturally, the only course of action was to throw these huge chunks of wood off the bridge and make some noise. We chucked the chunks, and when it hit the ground, it made some noise. But oh my lord god Jesus, the sound, the scream that came right after that will forever stick out in my mind. Outside of it being incredibly loud and urine-inducing, the best I can do is tell ya, it sounded half primate and half industrial machinery, like metal screeching while hydraulics hiss. Then, whatever it is we spooked or pissed off starts sprinting away through the forest below. Mind you, it was a full moon, and at that hour we had good illumination. We could see sizable trees bending at absurd angles by something with an insane amount of size and strength. Even its footsteps made a ruckus among its primates like grunts. Sadly, we weren't lucky enough to catch a glimpse of the beast through the dense forest canopy. Listen, I've seen a handful of black bear running in the wild. None of them made anywhere near that much noise while sprinting away. I was fortunate enough to visit South Africa once and saw a rhino sprinting through the safari just a few feet away from our jeep. Again I say, a rhino sprinting didn't even come remotely close to making that much noise. Nothing compares. Whatever it was has to be colossal. When I got back to my home in central Ohio. I scoured the net for recording of bear and mountain lion calls. Nope, nothing sounded remotely like the scream we heard. I have yet to hear anything like it on the dozens of animal documentaries I've watched or handful of remote camping trips. Once I concluded my story, my aunt and uncle jaws were on the floor. I asked them what was up. As it turns out, there was some Bigfoot show on at the time, and they had just seen an episode that took place at the Kinzwa Bridge. I didn't even know about the show's existence, and had never seen or heard of the episode. Neither had my buddy. So again, I don't believe in Bigfoot. No authenticated print, droppings, or animal carcass. The odds of something of that alleged size not leaving a conclusive trace of evidence has to be next to impossible. Is it more likely my friend and I shared in a delusion? I guess that's more likely, but we were not tried, impaired, or scared until we heard that thing. In closing, everything I said is 100% what we experienced and true. I'll never forget it. I want a rational explanation, but almost ten years later, I've found absolutely nothing. Number 15 My grandfather once told me that he had met someone a long time ago overseas, who had told him that she helped in the investigation of a murder of an entire family. The woman then told him, that the family were murdered with a pickaxe of some kind, and the killer was never apprehended. My grandfather said the woman had told him that the father of the family 
a few days prior, had told his co-workers that he had heard strange noises around this farm all the time, and that he had heard noises in the attic occasionally. The woman said that only days after this, a family member went to the family farm and found each and every one of them, including the maid, butchered. All the members of the family were brutally killed. One of the children, a girl, was found with strands of her own hair in her hand and had apparently ripped out her own hair whilst watching another member of her family be murdered. Or while she was herself being killed. The woman had also told my grandfather that the killer, whoever they were, lived in the house for a couple of days after everyone had died. He took care of their animals and ate their food. Years later I researched this and in fact found this to be completely true. My grandfather never mentioned where it happened or any names, but I'm sure he must have been referring to the unsolved murders of Hinterkaifeck. Number 60 This story takes place in the year 1912 in a little Iowa farming community named Valicia. One summer day, my great-grandmother was asked if she would like to stay overnight at her friend's house with two other girls. When my great-grandmother asked her parents if she could attend the sleepover, she was told that she couldn't, as there was too much housework that needed to be done, but that she could go over the next day after her morning chores had been completed. The next morning, my great-grandmother's friend, her siblings, her parents, and the two guests who were staying overnight were found murdered. Police discovered that all eight people had been bludgeoned to death. The murder weapon, an axe, was left in the house. The murder has never been solved. To this day, my family's unofficial motto is saved by chores. And yes, this story is used in my family to scare children into completing their housework. Number 17 St. Patrick's Day is a crazy occasion in most cities, and in my hometown of Dublin, it is no exception. Last week, I found myself with a few days off on either side of our national holiday, and so decided to get away from the madness of the city, and spend some time camping and hiking in the nearby mountains. On the eve of my trip, my buddy calls me to tell me that he is sick and would not be joining me on the adventure. Who needs him, I thought, and I decided to make the trip alone. The weather was beautiful, and I spent a very enjoyable St. Patrick's Day, hiking through the woods and mountains above Dublin, alongside a good number of smaller-minded folk. At roughly 4pm, I spotted a nice thicket of trees in the distance, had made my way towards them, to what looked like a perfect campsite. I found a clearing, set up a shelter, and prepared a delicious dinner before settling down with a book and the sounds of the wilderness for company. But at 7pm, something changed. I suddenly became very uncomfortable and agitated. There was someone nearby. Somehow I just knew it. It was completely dark, and I scanned the surrounding woods with my torch but could see nothing out of the ordinary. It was just me and the trees. Settle down, I told myself. It's natural to feel a bit scared when you're alone in the woods, but no matter how much I tried to clear my mind, I couldn't shake the gut feeling that the situation just wasn't right. I knew that the last bus left the nearest village at 10.30pm and it would take roughly three hours by foot to get there. In the heat of the moment, I decided to get the hell out of there and take my chances on the trail. I packed my gear in record time and moved out, stumbling over fallen trees and thick foliage until I hit the trail. I was in a panic, but comforted by the well-trodden path. 
a half hour of gentle descent and I'd be on the paved road. And after that, it was only an hour of well-frequented national road that led to the village. Only after a few hundred meters was I stopped in my tracks. Sitting on a tree stump just off the side of the trail sat a lone figure. By the light of my headlamp I saw that it was a man dressed in dark street clothes rather than the bright hiking gear one might expect. I was instantly on edge. There was no point in trying to hide as he had no doubt already seen me with my headlamp and reflective jacket. We drew closer in the darkness and I saw that this man was roughly in his thirties. As I passed, he looked at me, smiled and said, Lovely evening. Yeah, it is. I continued forward on my guard. After a minute or two, I turned to look behind me and saw no sign of the man. There was a house a kilometre or so in the distance, and I thought the best thing to do would be stop there for directions to the village road. Several minutes later, I felt a pang of uneasiness and checked the path behind me, only to see the figure once again, this time on foot, heading in the same direction as me. I hurried towards the house. I felt much more relaxed once I reached the warm glow of the cottage. I got the direction from a very nice elderly couple and was pleased to learn the road was just a small distance away at the bottom of their driveway. With no sign of the man behind me, I walked on. Just as I reached the road, I heard a banging noise from the direction of the houses followed by an out of breath familiar voice. <sighs> I've been separated from my friend. Did he come this way? Oh. Without thinking, I scrambled up the embankment at the side of the road and concealed myself as best I could. One hand on my camping knife. My heart has never beat so fast. I couldn't hear the householder's reply, just the sound of the door closing after by on the footsteps of the gravel driveway. I saw the man silhouetted by the moonlight walk into a road and peer into the distance in either direction before hurrying off in the opposite direction of the village. I waited in the hedgerow for about 15 to 20 minutes, completely terrified, before plucking up the courage to continue my walk to civilization. I trudged on for over an hour before I heard the rumble of a car engine in the distance and saw its headlights approach. I stuck at my thumb and to my surprise the driver stopped. I asked if he could give me a ride to the village and he said no problem. Once in the car, the driver, a friendly Polish man, asked if I was looking for my friend. Friend? No, no. I was out hiking alone and I just lost track of time. I lied, not wanting to admit that I got scared camping alone. Oh. I only asked because I was just flagged down by another younger man who told me he was looking for his friend and you fit his description perfectly. He seemed very agitated. In shock, I told the driver about my encounter with the mountain man and how he had headed in the opposite direction over an hour ago. Well, he must have turned around because he stopped me only a few hundred meters before the stop where I picked you up. Five minutes later, I was back in the well-lit, very populated village. I made it in time for the bus, and within the hour was back in the Dublin city centre. I have no idea what was going on with that man, or what he intended to do if he caught up to me. I'm just glad that I followed my gut, and was lucky enough to make it home, with nothing more than an odd story, and a big thank you to Darius for the lift. Number 18 My friend's sister Guinevere was moving and had to drive her truck from Denver to the East Coast. She stopped in St. Louis on the way to visit some friends, leaving their place just before dusk. She started driving in what she thought was the direction of the highway. The sky was getting darker. The streetlights were few and far between. 
and she suddenly realized that she was lost. She was in an industrial area now and was getting creeped out by the fact that no one was really around. Railroad tracks ran behind the rows of empty buildings. Since this was before GPS and decent cell phones, she decided to pull over into a parking lot and check her actual map. Guinevere pulls into an empty parking lot and stops, switches on her interior dorm light, and no sooner had she done this, a African American woman appeared at the passenger side window out of nowhere. She said, You need to get out of here. You're not safe. Guinevere went from creeped out to shocked immediately. She stammered, Uh, thanks and floored it all the way over to the other side of the parking lot and stopped again to look at the map. Immediately, the young woman was there again at the passenger side window. She says, You need to get out of here. You're not safe. Guinevere tore out of the parking lot and eventually made it safely to the highway. Two things that especially weirded me out. One, she had two dogs in her truck, not afraid to bark at strangers, and neither one of them registered that there was anyone outside at any point. It was like there was no one there. I've always heard that animals have more sensitivity to paranormal things than people do, so that was odd. And two, when the young woman spoke, Guinevere said that she could hear her voice plain as day, even though the windows were rolled up. She heard the young woman just like you would hear someone who was sitting right next to you. She was so bothered by what happened that she did what she could to search the St. Louis newspapers online to see if anything had occurred in the area. It turns out that a man had been killing women right around there and leaving their bodies near the train tracks behind the building that she stopped at. He would hide nearby and watch while the police and emergency personnel worked the scene of his victims. He had struck again that night, just before dusk. She believes to this day that someone, fortunately, was warning her not to linger. Number 19 This story happened to me about a year ago. My mother-in-law had come down for a little while and was visiting the state of Washington for the first time. In between our outings, we went to a new age store where I bought a Ouija board. It was a really nice looking one, and as we were testing it, it called me by my pagan name, and it was at that point that I knew I needed it. After we got home, I asked it something that had been bugging me for over two years now. What happened to my first Ouija board? The planchet spelled out one name, Mystic. I was not too happy for he had been an old roommate of mine and was currently in jail, so I had to call his sister to try and track it down. As she spoke to me, she told me that she had seen it at his girlfriend's house, but that something had happened to it. First, it is important that you understand that this board was not your average item. It was very expensive and had a glass top with runes cut into the glass along the sides. Anyway, when his girlfriend was transporting it in her car, she didn't secure it properly, and the whole glass cover shattered. Then, after she put it over a fireplace, she'd come to see a man with red hair, green eyes, and what she called medieval looking clothing. He vanished from sight, and consequently the board was burned to ash. I was upset, but could not help but smile after hearing this. All of that went on two weeks before I got my new board. Even though it does not look like my old one, it will do the same job as the other did, and that is to help others and fix what I can. It's good to know, though, that my dear God of Fire is always looking out for me. Number 20 On a 41-foot sailboat in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, 
with about seven other men doing a shakedown test cruise planned to be out for about 12 hours. Mid-1980s, not as reliable weather prediction resources. We get caught in a tropical storm, winds gusting into the 50 mile per hour range, just this short of a weak hurricane. We had just barely rigged storm hawsers and storm sails because the one fellow on board, who was the best sailor, sensed the storm was almost on us. Otherwise, we would have died. During the storm itself, I expected to die at any time. In fact, we made a securite, securite call on the radio. If you have time at sea, you know what I'm talking about. If not, it's not that important. For what seemed like 15 minutes, we were in a maelstrom, no visibility, but then it passed. We would live. This was about 3 p.m., and although there was cloud cover of course, the ambient light was such that you could see two miles or so in any direction. If you're familiar with the sea, you know that such storms particularly in shallower depths near land masses, dredge a lot of things of the sea floor. The sighting. We're all on deck, working lines, checking damage, etc. And the bay around us is choppy and churning and foaming. Old-timey sailors often use the saying, the sea is confused. I look about 15 feet off the starboard side, and something swims to the surface, breaks the surface, looks at us, then submerges again. It was like a thin man with humanoid shape, arms articulated like a man, a human head, but its skin was covered in scales like a snake. It looked at us, blinked its weird, heavy-lidded eyes, then dove back under. So maybe you need to know a few things about me at the moment. No drugs, no alcohol, no injuries. I was elated because I was glad to be alive, but my senses in that situation were sharpened, not dulled. I had, at the time, about six years experience on ships and fishing boats and had seen squid, octopi, flying fish, sharks, skates, etc. all around the world. I was not the type of guy to see a patch of seaweed and call it a sea monster. I made an instant decision that I was not going to say anything. What could I say? I just saw a strange creature. Take my word for it. The men on this boat were all mechanics and engineers and professionals. Why get a reputation as a flake? At the time, it was important for each of us to get D, Skipper, or OOD qualifications, and saying something like that would be frowned upon. And as I stood there in my life vest, soaking wet, hooked onto the steel lifeline, glad to be alive, one of the other sailors, a USN captain with over 30 years experience in the surface navy, piped up and said, I just saw a brown thing pop up on the surface. It looked like a lizard man with a scaly face. It blinked at us with these big eyes and then went back under. Yeah, I saw it too, I said. No one else said that they had seen it. Then we sailed back to the pier later that day and didn't speak of it again. Hey guys, it's Mort here. And thank you so much for listening. And well done for making it all the way through. You champions. I have a fun little idea. Leave a comment with the name of a vegetable. Like carrot or something. It'll be funny to see all the confusion going on. To the people who haven't or didn't yet finish the video. Let the chaos unfold. And whilst you're at it, please remember to smash that like button and subscribe as you won't want to miss what I have in store for you next. And remember, that if you've had a creepy or paranormal experience that you wish to share, feel free to send it to my email which you can find in the description. 
You can also follow me on my Instagram and Twitter at the Mortis Media for some secret stuff you won't find anywhere else. But anyway, for now, guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.